In this segment, we are talking about brass instruments. I'm a brass player myself, so I'll demonstrate one of them for you, but mostly I'm just going to show them to you and explain how they work. So we'll start with the trumpet. Most people know what this is. It's used in lots of different kinds of music, so it's pretty familiar. It's also fairly simple. As you look at it, you can see it's just a tube. It has three buttons. We call these valves. And you can see that they are in cylinders, rather like a car. So like a piston engine, you push down the valve and it goes up and down in the tube. So the question is, how do we make it make a sound? This is a, an interesting thing we do sometimes with children to get them to talk about that. And most people who don't play kind of have the same idea. They think, oh, you just blow into it and it makes a sound. So I'll do that and we'll see what happens. Well, it makes a sound, but it's not exactly the sound you were expecting. So what really happens in a brass instrument is that we have our mouthpiece, and this is a trumpet mouthpiece. It's a, shaped like a little cup, looks kind of like a bowl. And we do something that's not very dignified, doesn't look good without the horn, but this is what we do. Like, you know, when you're a kid and you made funny noises at your friends, that's what actually produces the sound on a brass instrument. Something has to vibrate. We know that about physics and sound. So what's vibrating is the lips. So I do that lovely sound, but I put a mouthpiece on it. And you can see I could actually sort of play a song just with a mouthpiece. That's because I'm changing what I do here. We call this the embouchure. It's a fancy word. It just means the way your lip is being used. I changed the tension. I changed the space inside my mouth and I can make higher and lower sounds. So that's how you make the sound. Not pretty by itself. Put an instrument on it, it's much better. So now let's look at my instrument. All right, this is my instrument. I'm a French horn player, and here is my horn. As you can see, it has a mouthpiece, but it doesn't look like a trumpet mouthpiece. See, it's kind of like a funnel, like you might pour something in your kitchen with. And that's the big difference between horn and all the other brass instruments. All the others have cup-shaped mouthpieces, Horn has a funnel-shaped mouthpiece. Works the same way. I can play it without the horn. So I attach it to my horn, and hopefully we get a much better sound than that. So you see that I have no pistons on my horn. Trumpet had those nice little pistons that the valves went up and down in. Horn doesn't have that. It has what we call rotary valves. You'll be able to see this better when we look at the tuba because it's bigger and you can get a much better view. But you can see that the valves are flat and when you push them they don't really go up and down but instead they turn these little things in the back. Mazda used to have an ad where they talked about their rotary engine and how a Mazda went hmm and everybody else's engine went clunk clunk clunk. It's the same principle. Pistons versus rotors. So every time I push a valve one of these rotors turns and it opens up more tubing in the instrument. Now in the old days, like before the 1820s or so, there were no valves on any brass instruments. It was just a big tube with a mouthpiece. And you could only play a certain number of notes. And those are based on what we call the overtone series, which is physics again, and you don't have to know a whole lot about that, but if you care, I can give you a, a link to some pages to explain that. Basically it means that with the tube that you have, you can play a certain set of pitches. So I'm going to play a set of pitches you could play as if I had no valves at all on my horn. So that's about, uh, what's that, three octaves that I can play with no valves at all. And you might have noticed that as I got higher, the notes got closer together. At the bottom, it was just like, boom, boom, boom. Sort of sounded like, um, also, Sprock Zarathustra, the 2001 theme, starts with those three big notes. The farther you go up you go, the more notes you have. So you can sort of play melody up there without any valves, but it's tricky because the notes are not quite in tune. You have to do a lot of adjustments. So what we did in the 1800s was add some valves. So that added more tubing. I don't know if you can see this or not, but there's a lot of tubing in my horn. 
there are two layers of tubing right on top of each other here and then a whole bunch of tubing in the back. If you unroll this, it would be 16 feet long. So you can see why it's curled up. Otherwise, I couldn't fit into my car. I would have to get a big truck just to haul my horn around, not to mention that it would take up the entire stage if I were playing in the orchestra. So we added these valves, and what that did was give us a whole new set of those overtone series. So if I just change the valve now, <laughs> etc. And before we were on different pitch. So every time we add a valve, we have a new set of tubing. Therefore, it's like a whole new instrument with every set of valves you add. But we only have three valves, and obviously there's more than three sets of notes in the world. So what we have is combinations. So we can have open, which is the thing I played for you first, like a horn with no two valves at all. Then we just go down through a series. It's a standard series. All the brass instruments have the same one. And every time we add a valve or a combination of valves, it opens up some combination of tubes. So every time you do a valve, it's a different length of horn and you have a whole different set of notes. Now, when I use on my horn, this is called a double horn. We have single horns and doubles. Most professional players use a double horn. That's why I have two sets of tubes. So I have these three valves, but I also have another valve on the back. And when I use this valve, it opens up all these tubes. So it's like having two French horns in one. So you can see that these tubes are different lengths. The ones that are on the top, which are now on our bottom because I've got the horn turned upside down, are longer. And these are shorter. So this means that the shorter horn has a higher pitch. You might remember from your elementary school science class, the longer the tube, the lower the pitch, and you took paper towel holders and you cut off bits and made different sounds and you could see that. So when I want to play really high on my French horn, I use that short side because it's already higher. It makes it much less work for the player to do that. So that's why I have two sets of valves and just makes kind of life much easier for a French horn player. We'll come back and look at some things that um, horns can do in just a minute, but let's look at some other instruments first. This is a trombone. It's really, really mechanically simple. Tube, mouthpiece. That's really it. We call this part the bell. All the instruments have a bell and it sort of looks like one. So a trombone has a slide. It doesn't have any valves at all. So how do we know where the notes are? Because obviously with the other instruments, I could just push some buttons down and something will happen. Trombone players have to know where the slide goes. Now, I'll give you a brief demo of this, but I'm not a trombone player, so cut me a little slack on this. takes a lot of air. So you can see that, or if you were counting, I went seven positions. And remember I said there were seven combinations on my French horn. So they match up. When I'm completely closed up here at the top of the trombone, that's the same as being no valves on my horn. So if you learn one, you can sort of know all the notes on the others just by matching up the positions that go together. Trombones also come in a double version, which has an extra set of tubing here and a little trigger like mine has here so that you can also play higher notes on trombone without working quite so hard. And all brass instruments have the proper name, water key, not a spit valve. As we talked about when we talked about going to concerts, we don't spit in our horns. It's just condensation and it has to come out somewhere. And that's where it comes out on trombone. Very simple. Trombones have been around, I guess, for a very, very long time. They didn't really come into being in the orchestra until like the late 1700s and 1800s, and before that they were mostly used for things you wouldn't think of. Like uh, they would put trombone players up in a church tower, and that's how they would warn the village that the enemy was coming, because trombones are loud. They could get up on top of the thing and they would play their alarm, you know, it's like a primitive alarm system on top of the church. Or they might use it to call people to church. It was actually a church kind of instrument early, which seems sort of odd because today we don't use trombones very often in church. All right, this big baby is a tuba, and it is huge. You can see, you can't even see my head. The bell is so large on this. Um, 
So notice that this has four valves, where our trumpet only had three, my French horn only has three, plus the one on the back. The tuba's so big already, hard to hold. As you can see, I'm working really hard to keep this thing together here. So they put the other valve on the front so they could, could manage it, because really the tuba players got to use that other hand to hold the horn together. So it's, it's just, it's busy. This happens to be a rotary tuba, and I said you'd be able to see the rotary valves better on this than you can on my horn, because they're much larger. Push down the valve, this turns, that hints the rotary part. Um, and basically, that's it for the tuba, which is really heavy, and I'm going to put it down now. I should mention about the tuba um, that this is not the instrument you see when you go to parades. This, as you saw, it's very heavy, hard to hold, and it doesn't really have any good grabbing points. And if you tried to march a parade with it, you would be exhausted. So John Philip Sousa, who was like the king of marches in the early 1900s, actually had them design a marching tuba, which is now called the sousaphone in his honor. So the one you've seen that goes like over their head and has a big bell, sometimes white, because they make them out of fiberglass because that weighs less. That's a sousaphone. You won't see it on a concert stage. You'll only see it in marching bands and like basketball bands. So it is the same basic instrument, except it's portable. So that's the big difference between this. So when you go to the symphony, you didn't see a sousaphone, you saw a tuba. All right, so now I have my horn back in my hand, back in my comfort zone, my nice, not so heavy horn. One thing that all brass instruments use is called a mute. And this is a mute. Obviously, this has to fit the bell. So they come in different sizes. The mute for a tuba is like the size of a small suitcase. It's just monstrous. Um, I don't know how they manage to transport them when they have to play gigs and they have to carry different kinds of mutes because there's actually more than one kind. But basically a mute changes the sound. Mute obviously tells us that it's making things softer. So it's inserted into the bell, which stops things up. So let's just give a quick undignified move there. That's what horn players do, undignified things. That's just as it would be. And I'll put the mute in and play the same thing. So it's a slightly different sound quality, and composers will do it for special effect. Um, you want to get the sound like the horns are far away, or um, you know, just maybe you're doing a kind of a creepy piece and you want a creepy kind of sound, you can do that with a mute. Trumpets have lots of different kinds of mutes. There's a wah-wah mute that you would use for jazz and it, to kind of stick it in the end of the bell and you go like that and go wah-wah-wah while you play. Um, there are straight mutes and this is basically a straight mute. There's a cup mute which has kind of a bowl attached to the bottom of this and covers up even more of the bell. So lots of different sounds you can create with different kinds of mutes, but all brass instruments have them. So if you see instruments at a concert and they're sticking things into their horns, start listening for a really interesting sound because that's what they're going for. Now, one thing that horn players can do that nobody else can do is called stopping the instrument. So normally when we play horn, we just have our hands sort of like this in the bell. And you notice that we're the only ones that go the wrong direction. Everybody else's bell faces you, except the tuba, which is going up and it's big and loud and doesn't need any help anyway. Everybody else faces toward the audience. Horns, the sound's going the other direction. So we have to work hard to get the sound out there in the first place. But the reason we do that is because the sound that we want you to hear for a horn is not supposed to be quite as brassy, um, not quite as edgy perhaps as other brass instruments. We're, we're a more mellow member of the family. And by facing the opposite direction, that sort of the background of, the, of whatever you're playing in changes the sound and sort of absorbs some of the hard edges of it and makes it a more uh, typical sound for the French horn. So normally we play, as I said, with my hand in the bell. But what we do when we stop the horn, instead of just sort of having it here so the sound gets out, is completely cover up the horn hole with my hand. Say, well, why do you want to do that? You just did that with a mute. Well, I'll show you what the difference is. So here's a note just played straight. Now I'm going to stop it, stuff my hand in the, the bell there. Listen to the difference. Here's the first note. I didn't do anything different except what I did with my hand. And if you think about it, what happened to the pitch? It got higher. I can't explain the physics of it, but stopping the horn actually makes everything go up a half step. 
So if you're a horn player and you see the music and it says, oh, I want you to play this note, but I want you to play it stopped. So if it wants me to play this note, but I'm playing it stopped, I actually have to play a different fingering. So French horn players are kind of wacky. I'll, I'll just take credit for that because we already play an instrument that's in a key different from everybody else, and we'll talk about that another day. But when we see notes on the page, they're not the notes we hear. And when we play stopped, they're not even the notes we're playing. So it's, it's kind of a weird thing, but it does make for a very interesting effect. So you'd have you know, a nice little... Kind of gives you an echoey sound. Um, which is sort of nasal in quality, even if you want to think about it that way. So it's a different kind of sound we can make, and we're really the only instrument that can get to do that. So in closing, we've had four major brass instruments today. We have the trumpet, which is the highest member of the family. It also comes in some smaller sizes, but we're not going to worry about that today. We have the French horn, which is sort of the alto member of the family. We have trombone, which would be like our tenor. And we have the tuba, which is our big bottom bass.